Hello, I'm Hushcho, and today I'm going to talk to you further about censorship and creative oppression and why those are bad things. Specifically, I'll be discussing a few points that come up sometimes as problem points with creative hosting and creative works in general. Recently, I had a slightly charged discussion with another creator about a situation they were experiencing. A group of people had come to the server they run with some modicum of monetary support, and a whole lot of people who didn't know and weren't interested in knowing, those of us who had been there for over a decade. They started insisting on some changes to make the site's policies more restrictive, and I was and am very strongly against them. And to make the whole thing simple, let me just say this. The simplest and most direct solution to not being upset by things existing in the world that you don't like is to avoid them. Don't look at art you don't like. Don't look at art by an artist whose style you don't like or find upsetting. The site has filters easily used to completely avoid anything and everything potentially objectionable. There is no excuse for not using them, just as there is no excuse to essentially force people to please your sense of propriety because you are, quite frankly, too lazy to click a mouse a couple of times. It is the height of arrogance, and childish arrogance at that, to insist your wants, not needs, upon other people, thereby affecting their lives negatively for something that doesn't concern you. It's not your business, and you don't have anything to do with it. All you have to do is be a grown-up and just not get into other people's business. It's like I said in an earlier video. If you don't like same-sex marriages, don't get married to someone of the same sex. Pretty easy to avoid. But people of this type aren't okay with even the existence of anything they disagree with. And as not only a gay man, but a polytheist, a vegetarian, an animal rights supporter, and perhaps most importantly of all, an artist, this is terrifying. To cater to people who cannot even accept the existence of something they disagree with is horrific to me, and it should always be opposed. It's a very small step from minor inconveniencing to major oppression. And that's what's kept minorities of all kind oppressed for centuries. It's always been a group of people dictating what they're allowed in existence, down to the very thoughts they're allowed to entertain in their minds or depict through whatever artistic medium they choose. These groups abuse the concept of safety, normalizing what they've been conditioned to accept by the increasing widespread social normalization of corporate culture. Safe for work is not and was never a question of anything being literally safe for a workplace. It was always a concept created to lead a person into thinking that these things are unsafe in life in general or are illegal or somehow inappropriate. This concept of safety perhaps ironically makes the people united in it feel threatened, and thus they are easily united against whatever happens to be the target at the moment. Nudity? Sex? Coffee? Gays? Vegetables? Just painted as unsafe, outside the norm, abnormal and unacceptable for polite company. We can't have you loving other men or showing your naked lady ankles in public. And people wonder why I find this so objectionable. It's because I belong to a number of groups of people who have been horribly pushed down. And what's more kept down due to this same tactic. It wasn't so long ago, and in some ass backwards places persists, that anyone with too dark a skin tone was regarded as someone you could assume is a criminal of some stripe and thus acceptable for attack. It's the same tactic. In fact, it's the exact same one. Unite people through fear, point fingers at those you deem unworthy, and let loose the dogs of war. God will sort them out, obviously, because he clearly has nothing better to do than deal with the results of human ignorance. They just ramp up the same exact tactic when their first attempt is challenged, usually by someone who isn't so easily cowed. They step it up to be a situation where the very existence of this thing inspires just so much danger. How horrible, how could you support such a thing? But that's like saying that you should do away with spoons because you technically could kill someone with one. It's extremely unlikely in the first place, and it will never be in real life what it is in the fantasy. But it's these same people who can't distinguish between reality and fantasy, assuming that everyone else has the same problem, and it's deplorable. It's along the same lines as saying that someone who writes or someone who enjoys to read murder mysteries must be a murderer. Yeah, I'm sure Truman Capote asked a lot of people to prepare to write in cold blood, just like I'm sure The Shining was one of Stephen King's most important possessions in serial murders. I have no tolerance 
for the dictatorial attitudes of the ignorant and fearful. These are the same Philistines that had the Sistine Chapel censored for hundreds of years because Michelangelo's naked people were obscene, and Michelangelo told them to go fuck themselves quite appropriately. Now, I'm going to address the three main concerns I hear repeatedly brought up, largely because I'm very tired of hearing the same tired arguments. Some people, especially lately, very unreasonably demand a strong position from people. But you don't have to embrace everything you simply don't condemn. You also don't have to condemn everything that you just don't care for. And even having said that, I'll admit right now, I don't care particularly much for these subjects in art, but they are still going to have an effect on what I draw. Whenever a limitation is imposed upon any aspect of creativity, there is a constant consideration in a creator's mind about getting close to that. This is regardless to whether or not they intend to, because art is heavily subjective. It is the perspective of an artist, put into a medium and shared with people who interpret it. There are so many things, such as style, technical quality, and so many other factors that shape this interpretation, both by the artist to the medium and later by the viewer. The viewer also has to participate. They have work to put into any creative thing with their own imagination. And to be completely pragmatic, addressing and attempting to address any or all of these concepts invariably leads to the shattering of communities and a whole lot of wasted time. If you take nothing else from this, at least take that. Better people have attempted to address these things, and at its best it leads to a Pyrrhic victory. Which is to say that the very thing they sought to strengthen was destroyed or ruined in the process. If you have enough time to waste with things that are toxic to a specific community and the creative community at large, you have time to work on bettering your community in more effective and mindful ways. And now, on to those subjects. The first is probably the biggest and most opinionated, and that is the concept of age in art. I cannot express what a stupid idea it is to try and impose real-world age standards on art. I will only say this, learn to distinguish between reality and fantasy, or if you can't, don't expect other people to do it for you. Attempts at policies on this invariably lead to endless debates that solve nothing and only ever make things worse. Even the people not directly involved end up being put off by all the needless conflict over a frankly stupid topic that so many other people weren't able to resolve and you aren't going to be able to either. Age is not something that can be depicted by any standard in art at all. An artist's style has a huge influence on how others think their characters are aged, and there can even be a vast difference in what they see as signs of age. I saw a Gundam series where everybody looked like a teenager, and the only indication that one of them was 40 years old is the fact that they had silver hair and a tiny wisp of facial hair. When you try to impose a very arbitrary line like hardline numerical age, you become a constant worry for creators who are stifled by the same fear that has been used to control them and put them in this position in the first place. What if someone thinks my character looks too young, even though he's a supernatural being who has no concept of time as humans do? And what if the person looking is older, which means that they're naturally seeing everyone as younger than they might be. It's a tendency of people to skew that way as they age. Why is that never considered? Why is that never asked? When they inevitably ask for support from their people, too, they frame it in a leading way so they'll get exactly what they want from that other person. And they were probably already inclined to agree anyway, sight unseen, they're a part of that same group. There's a tremendous and obvious bias, and it's all built on a very precarious basis. People like this have caused bands of series such as Kaze to Kino Uta, or The Poem of Wind and Trees, as it's sometimes translated. It's a series that deals with some otherwise rarely addressed social problems of its setting, primarily a European boarding school, and revolves around a tragic gay relationship between two lads. It's not remotely pornographic, it's beautifully written and expertly drawn, and as an aside, I must also note, the author was president of the prestigious Kyoto Seika University, and remains a worldwide authority on sequential art, as well as a number of other subjects, renowned and respected for many reasons, not the least of which is that she was one of the first extremely successful female Japanese comic authors, and one of the first overall to deal with same-sex issues in any modern mainstream media. Say that ten times fast. These are fictional characters, or at least fictionalized. The story is told for its reason, the art is created for its purpose. These are vistas of the mind, some more fantastical than others. 
The day we have immortal vampires walking around city streets and appearing on talk shows. The day we have the elves step out of the shroud of the forest. And the day we have the Amazon aliens land. Maybe then we can talk about real world consideration of them in art. But that's not the way it is. And I cannot tolerate people who can't distinguish between reality and fiction, dictating the way other people live and create and think, which is what this gets down to. The simple fact is that even reality in this world does not allow for the fundamental premise of this attempt at oppression. Nothing about it reflects a keen-minded perspective on reality or any ability to distinguish it from fantasy and imagination. It is just attempting to thought police and to apply this world's laws to beings that do not exist in it and is thus an incredibly pointless endeavor. I can't insist that you be forbidden to do this. It's your choice and your life to waste. But I can say that I refuse to allow you to impose this upon me. I have better things to do than engage in the prattling of the insane. The second topic is bestiality in art, and it's a whopper. For a while, this was even used to oppose furries and fans of anthropomorphic cartoon art, which is just so many kinds of stupid. Yet again, it goes back to attempting to impress a real-world concept that doesn't fit onto something that doesn't exist in this world, and it doesn't work. It doesn't even work conceptually. And so often, there's concern about this type of art in that it may be non-consensual and that there's concern about sentience. Why? How would we even determine that in a picture? I will say that I can appreciate a good tentacle piece. What would that count as? Why would it be a problem if, say, the tentacles are from a non-intelligent thing, like a magic spell gone wrong or something? They're not sentient and the person on the other end may not be consenting. Neither may the tentacles. But is this a problem you think is likely to come up in our world? Is this something that's going to affect anybody's life? If so, I'll have to ask you where you see this happening. But why does it matter? If these are the criteria you want to use, how are we even supposed to determine that? And why should anyone care? This is very much a case of not my problem. If you don't want to look at tentacles getting intimate with someone, don't look at the art. Again, it's not that hard. That's what he said. And now we come to the third topic, that of religious iconography. These are the big three controversial subjects in any kind of art, and frankly, it can virtually all be summed up by saying, it's a group of people who don't want another group of people to exist, so they do everything they can to shut up their expression. They can't wipe them out, so instead they silence them, which leads to their rights being whittled away and increasing demonizing of anyone who shares any trait with them or tries to defend them. Touching back for a moment on what I mentioned earlier, depicting a god, prophet, or otherwise spiritual figure does not endorse that figure. It also does not necessarily oppose them, much like any art or creative work. There's a strange attitude from a lot of directions these days that people aren't allowed to even look at, examine, or challenge certain things, and religion and spirituality are included in that list of taboos. We cannot dictate what someone's spirituality is and what their individual path may be. We cannot demand what someone's expression of those beliefs through art must be. We cannot do these things any more than we can or should accept them dictating that we must share their beliefs. With any of these subjects, people will want to know and really deserve to know. Where is the line? Why? And how do we know that? What room do we have to challenge this idea? Because all ideas worthy of respect must be able to withstand challenge and scrutiny. But this is impossible to pin down because these things are always subjective. And viewing something as obscene is a subjective value judgment. Insisting that we stamp something out or ban it from public discourse is a subjective value judgment. And the implications and repercussions of that chills me to the bone. You are never going to really get rid of anything you dislike, even if you get it banned from a platform you happen to be on. It will always be out there, turning up when you least expect and probably least want it to. While I'm not saying never to try with something genuinely horrible that shakes you to your roots, I am saying that creative oppression will never win. I'm not saying that to be a douche or anything, but it never has won, and I'm fairly confident that human nature isn't going to suddenly change on that fundamental aspect after 10,000 years. There is always going to be something you hate in art, because that's the nature of art. It's different people's perspective and feelings translated to a medium. You would be more likely of success if you just tried to stamp out art, and I believe we all know how people like that end up in a historical perspective. Fanatics and maniacs cast as the perfect villain in any story, because it's the creators who write the stories.